Good afternoon. Today's panel discussion is entitled The Administrative State on Trial. My name is Brian Johnson, and I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the Financial Services and E-Commerce Practice Group and the chair of its CFPB Working Group. Today's panel was jointly organized with the Executive Committee of the Federalism and Separation of Powers Practice Group. I have the privilege of introducing the moderator of today's panel discussion, the Honorable Eleni Rumel. Judge Rumel was appointed judge of the U United States Court of Federal Claims in February 2020. She previously served as the deputy counsel to Vice President Mike Pence from 2018 to 2020. Prior to her tenure at the White House, she served from 2012 to 2018 as assistant general counsel in the U.S. House of Representatives Office of General Counsel. Prior to her government service, Judge Rommel had a distinguished career in private practice. Judge Rommel, welcome. Thank you for being here today. I turn the program over to you to introduce our distinguished panelists and begin the discussion. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who are in the crowd, and for those of you who are joining us, joining us online, I am Eleni Rommel. I'll be moderating today's discussion. We have a very interesting topic uh, lined up for you today. For this panel, we'll be discussing recent developments in administrative law and their potential impact on federal agencies. To do this, we'll generally be focusing on four lines of cases. And these cases have challenged agency authority on separation of powers grounds and have the potential to really affect agency structure and practices and perhaps the balance of power between the branches. So the first group of cases involve the jurisdiction of federal courts over administrative proceedings. And earlier this year, the Supreme Court ruled in Axon v. FTC, excuse me, and SEC v. Cochran that district courts retain original jurisdiction over constitutional challenges in certain agency proceedings, which means that plaintiffs must no longer wait until their agency proceedings end to file their complaint in federal court when challenging, for example, an agency's structure or procedure or its existence. Um, one of our panelists here with us today, Greg Garr, argued the Cochran case, and we're especially looking forward to hearing from him about his perspective and perhaps some of the next steps in his case. Um, the next group of cases that we'll discuss are um, the student loan cases, United States v. Uh, United States Department of Education v. Brown, and Biden v. Nebraska. And these concern the Biden administration's authority to forgive student loan debt under the HEROES Act. And these cases were recently heard at oral argument by the Supreme Court, and they raise important questions about the major questions doctrine, statutory interpretation, and of course standing. And the third group of cases involve the constitutionality of the funding of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB. The Supreme Court uh, recently granted cert in CFPB v. Community Financial Services Association, and the case will be heard this fall. Notably, there is a circuit split on the issues in this case. The Fifth Circuit and the Second Circuit have issued contrary opinions on the topic, and this is a really fascinating case, not only because of the administrative law implications of the case, but also because it involves interesting standing questions. And naturally, the outcome in the case could have a significant impact on how Congress can structure federal agencies, and that's something we'll explore more today during the discussion. And finally, the Supreme Court is also considering a cert petition in Jarchese v. SEC, and in that case, the Fifth Circuit ruled that the Security and Exchange Commission's in-house administrative law proceedings violated the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial, the non-delegation doctrine, and the Constitution's take care clause. So as you can see, many of the same concepts, such as the major questions doctrine and um, the non-delegation doctrine are implicated in these cases, and there's really no shortage of activity in the administrative law field this year. And the outcomes in these cases may potentially affect uh, the current existence and the structure of our current administrative state. So to discuss these issues, we have lined up today um, really a, a quite a distinguished panel. 
I'm so pleased to be on the same panel with all of you. And um, I think I will just go down the line here and uh, introduce you one by one. I will start with Greg Garr, um, who's on the far, far right here. Um, he is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Latham & Watkins and the global chair of the firm's Supreme Court and Appellate Practice. He served as the 44th Solicitor General of the United States, acting as the federal government's top lawyer before the Supreme Court. And he's responsible or was responsible for overseeing the government's litigation in federal appellate courts throughout the, the nation. Prior to his nomination by the president and unanimous confirmation as SG, he served as principal deputy solicitor general from 2005 to 2008, and then as acting solicitor general. He also served as an assistant sol solicitor general from 2000 to 2004, spending almost a decade, it seems, in the office. And I am told that he is the only person to have held all of these positions within the office of solicitor general. Uh, Mr. Garr has argued 48 cases before the Supreme Court and has served as counsel of records in hundreds of other cases before the court. And perhaps most notable for this panel, as I mentioned, Mr. Garr argued the Cochrane case, this current term, the case in which the justices ruled unanimously in his client's favor. Uh, Mr. Garr received his law degree with high honors from George Washington University Law School, where he served as the editor-in-chief and he received his BA, cum laude, from, the, from Dartmouth College, where he was the Rufus Choate Scholar. After graduating from law school, he served as a law clerk to Chief Justice Rehnquist and also to Judge Sirica of the Third Circuit. Also joining us today, next to him, is Professor Richard Pierce. Uh, Professor Pierce is the Lyle T. Alverson, Professor of Law at George Washington University School of Law. Professor Pierce's academic work focuses on administrative law and government regulation with a particular focus on the energy industry. He is the author of over 20 books and over 150 articles on these topics and his work has been cited in hundreds of judicial opinions including uh, over a dozen um, in opinions of the United States Supreme Court. Since 1994, Professor Pierce has also served as, the, as an author of Kenneth Culp Davis's Administrative Law Treatise, the premier reference guide for the field of administrative law. And his work in the field has led him to testify in the House before the Judiciary Committee and the House Committee on the Budget as an administrative law expert. He received his law degree from UVA's School of Law and his Bachelor of Science in Economics from Lehigh University. And last, but certainly not least, is Professor Chad Squitteri. Chad Squitteri is the Assistant Professor of Law at Catholic University. Um, it's Columbus School of Law where he teaches administrative law, constitutional law, and law and technology. He joined the faculty last year after having practiced at Gibson Dunn as a member of the Appellate and Constitutional Law and Regulatory um, and Administrative Law practice groups. Before that, he served in the executive branch as a special assistant to former United States Secretary of Labor, Eugene Scalia, and a law clerk to then Chief Judge D. Brooks Smith of the Third Circuit. Professor Squitari's scholarship addresses administrative law and constitutional law topics his scholarship has appeared in numerous law reviews, the Missouri Law Review, the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, and the Virginia Law Review, among many others. Important to today's discussion, he has also recently written uh, articles about the non-delegation doctrine and the major questions doctrine, and we are interested and excited to hear your perspective as it relates to the discussion today. And he has also serves as a, he serves, excuse me, as a fellow with the Project for Constitutional Originalism and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition. Professor Squitteri also graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law and earned his Bachelor of Science from Florida State University, double majoring in finance and economics. So please um, help me welcome this distinguished panel. So I think what we'll do is we'll begin by hearing eight to 10 minute opening statements from each panelist. 
And then we'll move to a discussion of the cases that I mentioned. And finally, we'll open things up to questions from the audience. So please be thinking about and considering what questions you may want to ask. Um, uh, why don't we go down the line? Greg, would you like to begin? Sure thing. Thanks, Judge. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Axon and Cochran case as well as touch on the Jarkissi case a little bit. And as the judge mentioned at the outset, um, we, along with the New Civil Liberties Alliance, and including Peggy Little, who I see in the audience today, uh, represented Ms. Cochran before the Supreme Court. So uh, forgive me if this presentation is, is a little bit skewed, but uh, I think it's fair. Um, so the, the basic question in Cochran and the Axon case, which were two consolidated cases that were argued separately and decided together a week and a half ago, was whether the federal district courts have jurisdiction under 28 U.S.C. 1331 to hear uh, structural constitutional challenges to uh, agency proceedings before the SEC in the Cochran case and the FTC in the Axon case. And to just give you a, a general overview of the issue, uh, Section 1331, as you probably remember from your law school days, uh, grants broad jurisdiction over, quote, um, all civil actions uh, arising under constitution laws or treaties of the United States. And it's phrased in uh, mandatory terms that the court, district court shall have that jurisdiction. But the government has long argued that statutes creating administrative review schemes that give you an opportunity to petition a final decision of the agency uh, for review to a federal court of appeals um, impliedly displace the federal district court's um, jurisdiction under section 1331 to hear constitutional challenges to those proceedings at the outset. And if you looked at just the, the text of 1331, you might be a little bit surprised by that. But the, the court, going back to a decision in 2009 called Thunder Basin Coal versus Reich, had developed a sort of three-factor test uh, that largely placed a thumb on the scale of finding that district courts had been impliedly stripped of their jurisdiction any time Congress had enacted one of these administrative schemes. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the practical importance of this issue, um, I, I think the Cochran case illustrates that as much as, as any of the thousands of cases out there involving individuals who find themselves trapped in these administrative proceedings. So uh, Michelle Cochran was a mother of two single mother of two who worked for a small accounting firm in Texas. Uh, after a few years, she decided to leave the firm because of the abusive treatment from her boss, who she also had concerns about uh, his honesty as well. Uh, she thought she'd moved on, but several years after she left, the SEC initiated an enforcement action against her old firm, her boss, and lo and behold, Ms. Cochran herself. And Ms. Cochran's uh, wrongdoing alleged by the SEC was, was that she had failed to essentially um, uh, check various uh, uh, boxes in, in, as part of an audit, auditing form. It was uh, the, the quintessential um, paperwork violation in which uh, no one had been harmed from it and there was no um, uh, monetary loss as a result of this, but she left a couple of uh, boxes blank and the SEC went after her. Uh, the SEC settled the charges against the firm and with her boss, but she refused to settle. She was um, defending her innocence of this charge and she proceeded before an SEC ALJ. Uh, that proceeding uh, took several years. At the end of it, the SEC won, as it almost always does in its own courts. Uh, and imposed a $22,500 fine against Ms. Cochran and banned her from practicing um, and accounting for, for five years. She then brought that proceeding to the SEC Commission itself. While her case was before the SEC Commission, the Supreme Court decided uh, SEC versus Lucia, in, in which it ironically held that the very ALJ that had considered her case was unconstitutional. Um, you might think that was the end of the proceeding, but it wasn't. The commission sent it back before a new ALJ, uh, and then she got smart and hired the New Civil Liberties Alliance to get involved and go to 
uh, federal district court and bring a claim out of the box that the uh, SEC ALJ was uh, unconstitutional because it was protected by dual layers of removal from the president. SEC ALJs are only removable by cause, uh, by for cause by the Merit Systems Protection Board, and the merit, members of the Merit Systems Protection Board in turn are only removable for good cause by the president, creating the sort of dual insulation from removal that the court in the Free Enterprise case said violated um, Article Two. Um, the district court, however, uh, believed that it did not have jurisdiction over Ms. Cochran's structural constitutional claim, that that jurisdiction had been displaced by the SEC scheme under the Thunder Basin analysis. Uh, she appealed to the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit uh, panel decision affirmed that conclusion. Now, the Fifth Circuit panel decision in Ms. Cochran's case was emblematic of decisions that the Courts of Appeals had reached going back uh, almost a decade. Uh, the DC Circuit, Seventh Circuit, Fourth Circuit, um, Ninth Circuit, and, and Eleventh Circuit had all held, applying the Thunder Basin analysis, that district courts had been stripped of their jurisdiction to hear structural constitutional claims in the first instance that individuals had to sort of endure the administrative process that they could. Uh, most of them actually ultimately settled because they have to go on with their lives. Um, but that after that process, that they then could go to a, a federal court of appeals. Uh, I should note that there were three judges during this period who got it right and dissented. Um, judge Droney on the Second Circuit, uh, Judge Hayes in the Fifth Circuit, and Judge Bumatai in the, the Ninth Circuit. Uh, during this period, the Supreme Court itself also denied certiorari twice uh, on this issue, most recently in 2021 in a case that we worked on together with the New Civil Liberties Alliance. Um, but the Fifth Circuit, in its wisdom, granted rehearing a bonk in the Cochran case and last year ultimately held in a 9-7 decision that there was jurisdiction, the district courts had jurisdiction to hear Ms. Cochran's structural constitutional challenge to her ALJ. That created a conflict in the circuit, uh, a case out of the Ninth Circuit, the Axon case, which actually dealt with this issue in the context of FTC proceedings, was pending before the court. The court granted review in that case, and then the, the government brought the Cochrane case up there and urged it to hold it for the Axon case. We urged the court instead to grant review in Cochrane as well to resolve once and, and for all that district courts had jurisdiction over challenges to structural constitutionality of the, of the SEC administrative process, and the court agreed and so heard both cases together. Um, the court, the, the cases were argued back to back in November. The court issued its decision. Uh, about a week and a half ago, unanimously finding that the district courts do have jurisdiction to hear these structural constitutional claims. So Justice Kagan wrote the opinion for the court and, and eight members. Justice Gorsuch, as I'll mention in, in a second, uh, wrote separately. He concurred in the judgment. Um, Justice Kagan's opinion uh, applied the Thunder Basin factors, though in a more forgiving way than the federal courts of appeals had done for the decade prior. Um, she first looked to whether or not delaying judicial review would uh, foreclose meaningful review of the question and concluded that it would. Uh, and in doing so, she recognized that being subjective to an administrative process that was structurally in violation of the Constitution itself inflicts what the court in Celia Law had recognized was a here and now injury uh, that, that could not be redressed if the individual had been dragged through that process in the first place. And so therefore, in order to get meaningful review, you needed to get review now. And so she got past the first Thunder Basin factor. The next factor looks to whether or not the claims are collateral to the agency proceedings, and she concluded that Ms. Cochran's claim was. Uh, it was a, a claim to the structural constitutionality of the ALJ itself. It had nothing to do at all with, with anything that had happened in the underlying proceeding. And the third factor was whether or not the agency had expertise to resolve this type of claim. And once again, she easily concluded that it did not. And as the court has recognized in prior cases, agencies generally have no special expertise to resolve structural constitutional issues. 
So she, she concluded um, in a compelling fashion that each of the Thunder Basin factors had been satisfied and let, pointed to the conclusion that neither the SCC Act nor the FTC Act in the Axon case uh, actually could be interpreted to preclude uh, federal district court's jurisdiction under Section 1331 to hear these structural claims at the outset. So Justice Thomas concurred in the result, but wrote separately to, as he often, as he often does, to, to up the ante considerably. Um, he, he wrote in a concurring opinion that he had grave doubts uh, about what he called the constitutional propriety of Congress vesting administrative agencies with primary authority to adjudicate core private rights, rights affecting life, liberty, or property, with only deferential judicial review at the back end. In other words, forcing the individual to go through a process where her life, liberty, or property was at stake and only getting judicial review uh, in a petition for review of that proceeding in the Court of Appeals in which there are a number of deference doctrines that would apply to the agency's findings of fact uh, and certain other determinations. He, he questioned whether that was consistent with the Constitution at all and, and said that if private rights were at stake, the Constitution likely requires plenary Article III jurisdiction over such claims. It wasn't necessary for Justice Thomas to go further in this case, but as we'll talk about later, this may be an important decision down the road in cases like Jarkissi. So Justice Gorsuch concurred only in the judgment. Um, he wrote separately to say and argue strenuously that he would dispense with the Thunder Basin analysis altogether, uh, as he, he, he would have analyzed it simply as a matter of statutory interpretation look to the text of Section 31, which broadly says the district courts shall have jurisdiction over all constitutional um, claims or claims under law or treaties, and then look to the relevant uh, agency statutes and, and find that nothing in those statutes remotely purports to strip district courts of that jurisdiction. Uh, he questioned the authority of the courts to, to engage in implied jurisdiction stripping at all, which is the import of the Thunder Basin analysis, and explained um, quite strongly, I think, that the Thunder Basin analysis carries real costs, uh, both for individuals seeking to vindicate their rights and for lower courts who, he said, deserved better guidance. So thinking about the, the uh, implications and significance of this decision, uh, you know, first, very importantly, provides a direct avenue of Article III judicial review for individuals or entities um, raising structural constitutional challenges to administrative proceedings. Um, this could come in a number of different forms. Uh, in both the Axon case and the, and the Cochran case, they raised an important Article II challenge to the fact that ALJs are insulated from presidential rem removal unconstitutionally in the plaintiff's view. Um, but you could imagine claims in the form of uh, more conventional appointments clause uh, violations, uh, perhaps challenges to agency funding, like in the CFPB case, um, possibly Seventh Amendment challenges to jury trial rights, non-delegation challenges, you know, other challenges that people may come up with. So this is a very important class of fundamental constitutional challenges that can now be brought directly into district court challenging agency action. Um, second, I think it is important that the court unanimously underscored that these sorts of structural constitutional defects do inflict a here and now injury, which uh, I think magnifies the importance of this class of claims. Um, although the court and the majority opinion said that its decision shouldn't be read as professing a desire for more interlocutory reveal of this type. I think the fact that the decision was unanimous and the fact that it's written in, in you know, fairly broad terms does signal a different approach to the Thunder Basin analysis. You know, at a bare minimum, it shows that the you know, courts of appeals that over the course of a decade had read Thunder Basin to require um, divesting district courts of this class of claim, claims had been fundamentally wrong. And so I think it does require sort of a new understanding of the Thunder Basin analysis and a more forgiving analysis for finding jurisdiction. Uh, and I think that Justice Thomas's concurring opinion and Justice Gorsuch's 
opinion concurring in the judgment, um, both may have you know, lasting importance on their own. Uh, Justice Thomas's opinion, to the extent that it uh, invigorates underlying constitutional claims in this context, and Justice Gorsuch's opinion to the extent that it ultimately leads to the abrogation of the Thunder Basin Doctrine altogether. So let me just touch on um, Jarkissi briefly. So the SEC versus Jarkissi is actually one of the cases that had initially um, raised this jurisdictional claim and went up to the DC Circuit, and the DC Circuit in 2015 held that Mr. Jarkissi couldn't, uh, th there wasn't district court jurisdiction for him to bring um, structure, structural constitutional challenges to the SEC proceeding against him. So he went, that, went back and during the SEC proceedings, they um, entered a, an order against him. He then petitioned for review to the Fifth Circuit and raised a host of important um, constitutional challenges to the SEC's, SEC's authority, um, which, a, which a majority of the Fifth Circuit um, adopted in significant respect. So the Fifth Circuit in this case held that the SEC's ALJs, um, double-layered protection for removal, the very claim in the Cochrane case, had merit and that the SEC ALJs were unconstitutional for that reason alone. And then it went further to find that there was a, a Seventh Amendment violation in subjecting individuals to civil penalties in SEC administrative proceedings without a jury trial. And also that there was a, a non-delegation defect insofar as Congress had given, purportedly given the SEC the authority to proceed either in-house before its judges or in a federal court, that that broad delegation of power violate non-delegation principles. Um, this is a, a very significant constitutional ruling in itself. The government recently petitioned for certiorari of the Jarkissi um, decision. Um, that petition is now pending before the court, but given that the Fifth Circuit's ruling um, declares unconstitutional fundamental aspects of the SEC administrative scheme, I think there's a you know, very strong chance that the court ultimately would grant review in the Jarkissi case and hear it next term. Thank you so much, Greg. That's and we'll definitely discuss more uh, about Jarkissi coming up. I'd like to turn to you, Professor Pierce, for your opening statement. So let me start by congratulating Greg on his victory in uh, the Cochrane case. And, and as somebody who is on the other side on the merits issue that he's raised, uh, I, I have to say I agree completely with the court on the, the jurisdictional issue uh, on, on which he's already prevailed unanimously. Uh, I think that opinion is well reasoned and, and I think it uh, reaches the right result. I, I, I don't think anybody's interests are served by prolonged delay in, in, in knowing whether uh, the basic structure of the administrative state is constitutional. I think the, the earlier we, we all get answers to those questions, the better for, for everyone. So I, I really applaud the, the court and, and Greg on, on that. Um, uh, I, by the way, I count uh, uh, eight constitutional and structural uh, attacks that are likely to come before the court in the next three years. So this has really opened the way to uh, a, a lot of things that uh, will allow uh, those of us who make a living uh, uh, writing uh, uh, law review articles uh, uh, provide us uh, endless work. Uh, uh, the, now, the merits issue in the Cochrane case is uh, 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 the constitutionality of the four cause limit on the power of the head of the agency to remove an ALJ. And, and on that issue, I disagree completely with, with Greg. Uh, the, uh, so let me go through the history of, of this. Uh, uh, during the 1930s, there were lots and lots of complaints to Congress about the systemic bias of what were then called hearing examiners, uh, uh, now referred to as administrative law judges. Uh, uh, the, 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 the allegation was that they were systemically biased in favor of the agencies uh, where they presided. Uh, and. Uh, uh, there were a couple of studies that uh, supported those complaints. So Congress try, was trying to figure out, well, what to do? Well, the, after uh, over a decade of deliberation uh, and consideration of a wide variety of potential solutions, they came up with one that I think was really quite clever and 
continues to do the job very well. Uh, first thing is to, to try to provide as much decisional independence to the ALJ as possible. And there are actually six different provisions of the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946 that are designed to accomplish that. The most important of those provisions is the provision that says that the, the head of the agency cannot remove or otherwise discipline uh, uh, an ALJ uh, without uh, ha having a cause to do so. And that's critically important if you're going to try to, to, to uh, minimize the role of systemic pro-agency bias. Uh, uh, in the absence of that kind of a safeguard, it's pretty easy for, for the uh, head of the agency just to say, I'm the boss sport, decide it my way, uh, and with, with uh, uh, pr pretty big clout uh, implicitly behind that, that command. And we have studies in the context of a couple of other agencies where they don't use ALJs, uh, they use instead adjudicators that, that are not subject to those safeguards, that those adjudicators uh, report that they are subject to systemic bias uh, pressure all the time uh, from uh, the, the, the political leadership of an agency to decide a case a particular way. So Congress said, okay, we're gonna confer on ALJs, these six different sources of insulation from potential pressure from the, the, the head of the agency in order to minimize uh, the, the, the risk of uh, systemic pro-agency bias, including most importantly the, the uh, limit on the, the power of the agency head to remove an ALJ. Uh, now, Congress at the same time recognized that while most adjudications do not raise significant policy issues that should ever come to the attention of uh, 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 the, the, the president uh, or any uh, senior political official, sometimes they do. And, and so in that same statute, the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946, Congress provided that the agency could, if it chose, replace the ALJ's decision with its own decision. And uh, all of the regulatory agencies have procedures through which that can be accomplished through an inter uh, application of a, an interagency, intra-agency uh, appeals process. Uh, so in the rare case where uh, an adjudicatory decision issued by a, an ALJ raises some serious policy issue, uh, uh, the head of the agency can replace the ALJ's decision with his own decision. Well, that provides a, a much more transparent means through which uh, the, the president can uh, exercise control over policy making with, with, within an agency. And I think the worst possible step we could take at this point is to maximize, to eliminate that major source of insulation from uh, 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 systemic bias, thereby leaving all ALJs subject to the whims and caprices of uh, their, their political uh, bosses uh, to, to, to say, I want you to decide this case this way, uh, and, and thereby controlling the outcome of a lot of adjudications in a completely non-transparent way. So I'm against him completely on the, the uh, uh, merits issue that will come next before the court in that case, but I, I, I continue to applaud his wonderful victory uh, on the jurisdictional and, and timing issue. I think that was very important. Uh, I just want to mention briefly uh, two other cases that we may come back to later in the discussion. Uh, uh, one is the um, challenge to the uh, funding of the CFPB uh, as a violation of the Appropriations Clause as, as part of the architecture of the statute that created the CFPB. Uh, what, what Congress was trying to do there was to create an agency that was a, as independent of the executive branch as possible, and one of the means they chose to do that was uh, to, to, to provide a, a mechanism through which it could be funded without going through the appropriations process, so it could thereby avoid both OMB review uh, and uh, review uh, in, in, through the appropriations process. And that has been challenged uh, in another of the uh, attacks on the, the structure of at least uh, one agency. And I th think that's a very serious challenge, and I, I, I'm not quite sure how it should come out. 
I, I am a bit concerned, though, that the court is likely to run into some serious line drawing problems. There are many agencies that get a, a, a high proportion of their funding, in some cases 100% of their funding, uh, through means other than appropriations, and therefore never have to go to OMB or to, uh, 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 to, to Congress uh, to go through the appropriations process. Uh, in 1989, for instance, uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, upheld uh, a, a statute that uh, 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 instructed the, the Department of Transportation to impose a tax on all pipelines uh, in order to uh, fund uh, the newly enacted pipeline safety program uh, to be implemented by the Department of Transportation. Congress uh, uh, made that decision and instructed, so instructed the agency not to uh, give the agency independence, uh, but because Congress, in Congress's view, uh, the, that was an agency that should be completely self-funded, that the, the general public should not have to pay, bear the cost of that agency. It was, after all, serving the interests of pipeline safety, and so uh, the Supreme Court unanimously upheld that. Well, how, how is the court going to distinguish uh, between arguably impermissible uh, uh, ways of, of circumventing the appropriations process and the OMB uh, 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 process that are intentionally designed uh, to serve that purpose versus the many circumstances that for completely different and permissible reasons, uh, Congress has said that an agency should be wholly or partly funded through uh, things like uh, uh, fees that it charges to, to get permits. That was the, the, the way that uh, DOT exercised the, the the authority that Congress uh, conferred upon it in, in that case. So I think the court, if it decides uh, that the CFPB uh, funding mechanism is a violation of the appropriations clause, is gonna have a lot of problems with, with line draw drawing in, in future cases. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pierce. A lot of interesting a lot of interesting topics to discuss there during the discussion portion. Uh, I will turn it over to you, Professor Scuteri, for your opening statement. Great, thanks so much. So I, I think the AV is working, but someone let me know if that's not the case. So I want to spend the <clears throat> majority of my remarks talking about the CFPB case, and in part because I have an essay coming out on it soon. Uh, but uh, I want to start off by talking about a major theme that I think connects some of the cases we're talking about today. And that major theme is this concept that I like to call bubble wrapping, which is uh, insulating agency action from literally uh, all sorts of public input, whether that public input put is channeled through uh, Congress, the president, or the judiciary. And the idea is that you know, public, uh, public input is dangerous, and we have technocratic expert agencies who need to make decisions outside of the public uh, oversight. Uh, so we need to protect that decision-making process uh, by all means. And I, of course, uh, disagree uh, with that, but I think we see uh, this uh, show up in a few different areas. So let's start with the, the president and how agency action is bubble-wrapped or insulated from uh, the president's input. So as those of us that follow administrative law know, there's lots of provisions. We've talked about some of them today uh, that purport to limit uh, the president's authority to remove executive branch officials from the executive branch. Uh, and the Roberts Court has made clear for some time uh, that these removal protection provisions can present constitutional problems uh, in various circumstances. So free enterprise, we learn, uh, the accounting uh, oversight board members, uh, those are unconstitutional for being doubly insulated from the president's removal. Uh, seal of law, we learn that if you want to have an agency with a single head, uh, that single head's going to need to be removable uh, by the president. So it's unclear how much uh, uh, further down this path the Roberts Court uh, might go to ensure that the president uh, remains uh, controller of the executive branch. Uh, but as mentioned in the Jarkizi case, uh, one of the questions presented is indeed this double insulation question uh, about uh, ALJs. Uh, next, what's, uh, I want to think through how uh, agency action is insulated from congressional uh, oversight, uh, public input being channeled through Congress. And here I think the CFPB case is a great example. Uh, so most agencies 
have to go to Congress with hat in hand and say, please give us uh, appropriated funds so we can continue on the agency mission. Uh, and at that moment in time, Congress can pause, look at the agency policy and determine we are the people's elected representatives. Do we like this policy? Do we wish to continue funding it? And as we hear from Professor Pierce, uh, the CFPP, CFPB was designed specifically uh, to be taken out of that appropriations process. So rather than have uh, the people channeling their will through the elected representatives who will determine, hey, how are, how are we going to spend the people's money? Or do we like this policy? We have a situation where the CFPP just sends a note uh, to the Fed and, and doesn't have to um, uh, be subject to that congressional oversight. And then finally, I want to talk about uh, the judiciary. Uh, so here we see efforts to insulate agency conduct uh, from public input channeled through the public federal court system. And I think we see this in at least two uh, scenarios. One are exhaustion requirements. Uh, so here, of course, we have agencies saying, no, 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 you cannot uh, subject us to review in a federal court until you go through uh, this lengthy internal review process. Um, and you know, after uh, uh, the work of Greg and NCLA and others, uh, now that we have Axon and Cochran, of course, a lot of these uh, stru structural constitutional uh, 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 arguments can be can get their day in court a lot earlier than they would have uh, about 10 days ago even. <clears throat> Another example of I think insulating agency conduct, uh, bubble wrapping the conduct from a judicial intervention is uh, the kind of aggressive action we've seen in the student loan cases. Uh, there uh, we see uh, the, the, uh, the agency really making substantive changes to its policy mid-litigation on the fly uh, for what looks to be the sole reason of insulating that agency action from uh, judicial oversight. So that appears to be a, a pretty strong break with norms. Traditionally, you would present uh, only those policies that you believe to be lawful and then defend the legality of those policies in court. Um, so structuring a, a, a policy specifically to uh, make it nearly impossible to challenge in court seems like another effort to kind of insulate, to bubble wrap the agency action from, from public input, this time coming through uh, the federal court system. So that's how I see the cases uh, kind of connecting at a 30,000 foot level. Uh, but let me uh, dive a bit more deeply into the CFPB case. Uh, so uh, Congress's appropriations power is surprisingly not uh, that uh, um, uh, it's not that well discussed generally in the administrative law scholarship or really even with a lot of a judicial precedent. And I think that's surprising because on the grounds, uh, whether an agency is going to receive funding is very important. Uh, but I think this relatively clean slate that we have about um, the appropriations power gives an originalist court like the Roberts court uh, a lot of room to maneuver and to think through the Congress's appropriations power uh, from, a, from first principles. And when I say first principles, uh, I really mean first principles. So what I think uh, the, the court should uh, consider in the CFPB case is start with the basic question. You know, where in the Constitution is Congress vested with any authority to appropriate funds? And you might think, well, there's this thing called the Appropriations Clause, and sure enough, there is. Uh, but as I think is relatively uncontroversial, the Appropriations Clause doesn't actually vest Congress with the authority to appropriate funds. It refers to an appropriations power that is presumably vested elsewhere. Uh, the clause says, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequences of appropriations made by law. And what this clause is doing is telling the President, President, you can't unilaterally uh, take funds from the Treasury. You need to go to Congress. Okay, so where might Congress's appropriations power be vested? Well, the only other constitutional reference to the appropriations is, again, a limitation on some sort of appropriations power, not a grant of that power to begin with. And that, of course, um, is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 12, which essentially says, uh, Congress, you can only appropriate funds for military ventures for uh, two years at a time. Okay, so if those two references to appropriations don't vest the appropriations power, where does it come from? Uh, a lot of people would say the taxing clause, and that's probably where the court is about now. Uh, but I think the best reading of the taxing clause is to recognize it as just that, a power to tax, to bring in money, not treat it as a power to spend, right? So you have a power to bring in money for various enumerated reasons, promote uh, common defense, general welfare, not to just spend blindly to promote those policies if they're unconnected uh, to a specifically uh, enumerated power. 
Okay, so where is the appropriation powers vested, right? Certainly we know that Congress can appropriate funds. Where does it come from? Well, according to my theory, uh, it comes from the, uh, the interconnection between two groups of constitutional provisions. Uh, so the first is uh, Congress's substantive powers. So these are Congress's powers to, to punish piracies, to regulate interstate commerce, to establish tribunals, on and on. So we have those powers, and then it's the in interconnection with Congress's necessary and proper clause authorities, which give Congress the power to make all laws necessary and proper to carry into execution some other power that's vested elsewhere. So the idea, for example, is a necessary and proper means for Congress to carry, say, its power to punish piracies into execution is for Congress to appropriate funds to maybe go you know, catch pirates on the high seas or what have you. Another example, a statute that uh, appropriates funds uh, to buy military equipment, that is likely a necessary proper means of carrying the president's commander-in-chief power into execution. So Congress has the authority to make necessary and proper laws to carry some other power into execution, not just spend uh, as, as Congress would like. Okay, so what power uh, might Congress have been carrying into execution to fund the CFPB? I think arguably it's the Interstate uh, Commerce Clause Authority. So I think the question that the court should be asking in the CFPB appropriations case is whether this CFPB funding statute, which takes uh, the uh, CFPB out of the normal appropriations process, is that a necessary and proper means of Congress carrying into execution the Commerce Clause Authority? And in the research that I've done to date, I suggest that no, that is not a necessary and proper exercise of the uh, uh, Commerce Clause Authority. And why is that? Well, we start with a historical baseline of annual appropriations. Uh, this was the way that uh, the government's familiar to the ordinary reader in 1788 when the Constitution was ratified. Annual appropriations was how governments were funded. Uh, my understanding of England, uh, early uh, colonial American governments, and the first Congress adopted annual appropriations. Uh, the SG in the CFPB case, so far in its um, uh, cert stage briefing, says, well, we have historical exceptions to this. Look at the way the post office is funded. It's funded through postal fees. Look at the way the National Mint was funded historically. It's funded through coinage fees. But if you adopt my framework, you realize that those examples are unhelpful to the government because those are examples of the government, of Congress, carrying its power to uh, establish post offices into execution and its power to coin money, Article 1, Section 8, into uh, execution. And it turns out there's historical support that would have been familiar, familiar to the ordinary reader in 1788 that, okay, yeah, the normal way of funding postal systems is through postal fees, and the normal way to fund the coining of money uh, is through coinage fees. And I don't see a, a, a similar historical analog for Congress carrying its uh, Interstate Commerce Clause authority uh, into execution. Uh, so that, that, that's my uh, pitch of what I think the court should do with the CFPB case. Um, but uh, I enjoyed the comments, and I look forward to see uh, what, judge, uh, what questions judge has for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that overview. I think I want to start with you, Greg, and give you a chance to address what Professor Pierce uh, was talking about. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court's decision in your case that you argued now permits the plaintiffs to challenge the agency's proceedings in federal district court. And I was hoping you could discuss the merits claims. I, I think you might want to um, in light of Professor Pierce's comments. And um, also how they might differ or how they're the same from the claims in Jarkizi. Right. So uh, on the last point, the, the insulation from removal question in Cochrane is really the same as the insulation from removal question in Jarkizi because they're before the same injury agency and the same um, the same removal protections apply. And again, it's, it's the, the SEC ALJs are only removable for good cause by the Merit Systems Protection Board, which in turn is their members are only removable by good cause by, by the president. And, and that sort of creates um, exactly the same problem that the Supreme Court identified in the Free Enterprise Fund case, which dealt with members of the, the so-called peekaboo board. And so the, the government's argument that pr Professor Pierce made well here today is that, well, ALJs are different because they're uh, engaged in adjudicatory functions, and so the free enterprise analysis doesn't really apply here. 
And I, I guess I'm, I'm skeptical of that argument. Um, for one thing, that the court in the uh, Lucia case has already held that SEC ALJs are inferior officers um, for purposes of Ar Article II. Um, for the another, you know, the, the argument goes that the SEC ALJs, you know, wield broad authority, essentially, you know, exclusive authority over these important proceedings can impose punishment in those proceedings and enter orders that have, you know, very serious um, implications for the uh, respondents in those proceedings and so therefore are sort of executive in that sense or at the very most are sort of a, a, a sort of quasi-judicial type officer that the Supreme Court in the Myers case had recognized were subject to the same sorts of removal um, protections. I, I think though that the professor raises a, a, a fair point to question whether or not at the end of the day if, you know, that we're better off at the scheme in which the ALJs are directly accountable, whether they're gonna, you know, whether or not those protections for removal actually result in, you know, more independent um, decision making. I, you know, I, I think that's debatable because um, the studies show right now that the SEC ALJs in these proceedings are, you know, ruling for the SEC in 90% of the cases. So I think if you look at the sort of objective evidence, it does not suggest that we have independent decision making going on at, at its finest right now. Um, I, I also think you can debate whether or not you've got better SEC ALJs if they're, you know, truly accountable to the president versus just worrying about how the, you know, SEC or, or MSPB are going to, you know, view their actions. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, may, maybe the, 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 the right answer is that these proceedings really belong in federal court and not the agencies to begin with. I mean, the, the agencies have sort of, you know, taken the easy way out in funneling cases before these, you know, in-house proceedings in which they win in virtually all the cases. Um, there, there some, there's a separate route that Congress has provided, and that's to take these cases to a federal court, which is the place that we know that they can get an independent decision maker. Professor Pierce, do you have anything you want, you'd like to add? Um, well, Greg just raised really what I consider a completely separate issue of whether uh, uh, these cases should instead be resolved in federal court, and that gets back to Jarchese, which is that's one of the issues in Jarchese, although they, the Fifth Circuit uh, decided to use the Seventh Amendment right to jury trial rather than Article III judicial power as the basis for its decision. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I have taken a pretty close look at uh, uh, Jarchese, that aspect of Jarchese, and what would happen if the uh, Fifth Circuit's approach were to prevail in that case. What the Fifth Circuit says is uh, the, the reason that uh, um, uh, the, the Seventh Amendment right to jury trial applies is because there were fraud cases in 1789 uh, uh, that were uh, triable before a jury, and that is uh, one of the tests uh, uh, for determining whether uh, Congress can allocate a class of adjudications to an agency. Uh, the problem is that the, the, the Fifth Circuit said, well, they weren't the same kind of fraud cases, but they were akin to this kind of fraud case. The Supreme Court has explicitly rejected that reasoning on two different occasions, saying the fact that, that a provision is, is, a proceeding is analogous to a proceeding that could have been uh, tried before a, a, a jury in 1789 is, is irrelevant. What we're interested in is whether this cause of action could have been tried before a, a, a jury in uh, uh, 1789. And that obviously is not the case with respect to this, this class of uh, securities fraud cases. There, there were no such, uh, was no such cause of action in 1789. And if the Supreme Court were to uh, adopt the Fifth Circuit's reasoning and change uh, quite dramatically the, its approach to determining when Congress has the discretion to allocate a class of adjudications to agencies and say, well, whenever it's akin to, uh, in, in the words of the Fifth Circuit, uh, uh, an action that could have been 
tried before a jury in 1789. Well, we have a host of problems because uh, I, I did a little Google search of the U.S. Code and discovered that there's over a thousand places where the standard is just and reasonable. Uh, just and reasonable was a standard that has been around in, in, in federal statutory law in many contexts for a very long time, uh, and it's, a, uh, it's, it's implemented almost exclusively by agencies, uh, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, and on and on. And uh, that uh, same term was used in, as the basis for jury trials in cases in which people challenge the validity of uh, charges made by innkeepers. Uh, in England, as, as far back as the 14th century, it continued in England all the way through the time uh, of, of uh, uh, England's uh, 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 arrival in, in North America. It crossed the pond with the Brits and uh, was adopted as the common law of every colony uh, uh, in, in the United States, and you could get a jury trial on, on that issue. My God, if, if, if you can get a jury trial on the basis of anything that is akin to uh, an action that you could get a jury trial on in 1789, well, the Supreme Court would have, would have just multiplied the number of jury trials in the United States by a factor of somewhere between 100 and 10,000. And of course, we do not have the capacity to handle that, that volume in the Supreme Court. The problem with constitutional rulings is, you know, they can't just say, well, there's this one little slice of cases where we, we you, you, you gotta, <laughs> the holding is almost certainly gonna be applicable to a very broad, large number of cases. And they gotta be really careful about how they decide these cases in a way that doesn't explode the entire legal system of the United States. That adoption, the adoption of that Fifth Circuit decision in Jarchese would, would just explode the, the number of jury trials that would have to be made. And anybody who knows anything about the institution of jury trials, we, we use it only in, in uh, uh, less than 1% of civil cases. I mean, it is a real rarity when the right exists today. For very good reason, we don't have the resources to staff jury trials uh, in large numbers. Uh, and, and so uh, adoption of that theory would create tremendous practical problems that I don't think the Supreme Court wants to get into. So I, I suspect the Supreme Court will stick with uh, its, its precedents and continue to say, no, that cause of action was not triable before a jury in 1789, and hence uh, it, Congress does have the discretion to uh, assign adjudication of that class of cases to uh, a, an agency in, instead. Uh, but in any event, that is completely independent of the question of the constitutional validity of the four cause limit on the power of the head of an agency to remove an administrative law judge. Professor Squitari, I was wondering, you know, you've heard about the history of ALJs. What role do you think that they should play in our regulatory regime? And let's say the Fifth Circuit's ruling is adopted by the Supreme Court. Let's say first they take the case and then it's adopted. How should our ALJ system be restructured, perhaps, to avoid constitutional problems? What would you suggest? Yeah, so I guess as an initial matter, I'm okay with ALJs uh, adjudicating at least some claims as so long as the parties consent to that. Um, parties consent uh, to arbitration, to litigate in front of magistrates, uh, things like this all the time. So as long as the party's consenting, I, I, that's one uh, uh, way to carve uh, a lot of cases off. Uh, if the Supreme Court were to adopt uh, um, this ruling, uh, I suppose I would want to see ALJs um, uh, certainly accountable to removal by the president. Uh, I, with, I, I understand Professor Pierce's point uh, that perhaps we want some sort of to mimic Article Three somewhat and make them relatively independent. Uh, but as Greg mentions, I don't, I don't think the stats really show that out. I think um, ALGs are, are very often ruling uh, with their home institutions, even if we were to centralize, I've seen proposals to centralize ALJs, 
um, so they're not really connected uh, to one of the agencies, I'm, I'm not sure um, that would do much good. So I think uh, if they're within any branch at all, they're within the executive branch, and the president's head of the executive branch, so they should be removable by that, the chief executive. Interesting. Well, speaking of removal, uh, several recent cases have touched upon Humphrey's executor, and um, Jarkizi involves presidential removal power uh, as well. Um, Professor Pierce, do you believe that Humphrey's executor is president that, pre precedent that is likely to stay intact with all these cases? You said there's at least eight cases, maybe not on this, but coming, coming down the pike. Um, and especially in the face of challenges like the one presented in um, Illumina pending before the Fifth Circuit. Yes. So, the, yeah, th this is going to be a really fascinating case to, to, to watch, the Illuminati case. So <laughs> here's what happened uh, in, in outline form. Uh, 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 Illuminati uh, wanted to, to uh, merge with Grail. Uh, uh, frankly, I, I don't understand the market. I don't know the firms. I, I'm only interested in the, the, the legal issues. Uh, 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 that proposed merger did not raise any horizontal problems. It, it raised in the minds of the leadership, the current leadership of the Federal Trade Commission, a vertical uh, problem. Uh, well, that in itself is, is, is a bit unusual since uh, the FTC had not brought a case, had cha not challenged a, a merger based on alleged vertical problems uh, in 50 years. Uh, uh, but in any event, they decided that this, this merger would create some kinds of problems uh, through, through vertical means. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so they, they sent the case to an ALJ. Uh, they only have one ALJ, by the way. Uh, there's only one ALJ at the FTC. But they, they sent the, the, the case to their ALJ, and their ALJ had a full trial, and the ALJ said, I don't see a problem. And so he, he, he decided against the agency. Now, let me just stop there and ask you, what, how do you suppose he would have decided that case if he could be removed uh, at will by, the, the, by, by Chair Khan? Uh, I don't have any doubt how that would have come down. Uh, but in any event, he- I think he, just to cut in, I think that was the first time in the history of the FTC that an ALJ had actually not- <laughs> Certainly were. <laughs> In, in recent so, history, so that was agreed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, the, you know, there's always the possibility that the FTC was right in those other cases and wrong in this case. But in any event, uh, we, we, that, those, that's the facts of this case. The, the FTC overruled the ALJ, uh, and uh, they uh, went to court. And they're trying to enjoin uh, the, the, well, actually, the merger was already completed. So, so they're trying to force uh, Illuminati to divest all of the assets of, of, of Grail, and Illuminati says, aha, what agency is trying to do this? The FTC. Well, the FTC is unconstitutional because the Supreme Court should overrule Humphreys versus, <laughs> versus Humphreys' executor. Uh, and uh, so we have teed up here uh, another big challenge, uh, a challenge. And, and if they overrule Humphreys' ex executor, then uh, there's no question that would apply to virtually all agencies. There'd be a couple that wouldn't, uh, would, would still be out there, like the, the Mine Safety and Health Review Commission and the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission that has nothing but, but uh, adjudicative responsibilities. But all the other agencies that are now considered independent uh, because their heads uh, are subject to this four cause limitation would be affected the same way if, if the Supreme Court overrules Humphrey's executor. I think there's an excellent chance that the Supreme Court will overrule Humphrey's executor. Uh, uh, my, my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Bill Kovacic, uh, can go through a whole long description of how uh, the FTC has completely changed since the Supreme Court decided Humphrey's executor. And you know, just the idea that you know, it, 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 it's quasi adjudicated. He's only got one ALJ and he doesn't have much to do. Uh, uh, they, they don't do a whole lot of in-house adjudication anymore. Uh, they, they were, the, the court uh, in, in Humphrey's executor said, well, they're quasi-legislative. Well, that's because back in 1935, Congress had no staff. 
And so when Congress got complaints from constituents that, that there was a need that constituents received for legislation in some area, they, they turned to the FTC and asked for the FTC for advice. And the FTC sent these voluminous uh, reports recommending uh, what became the Natural Gas Act, the Federal Power Act, the Public Utility Holding Company Act. So they were an advisor of God. Well, of course it made some sense to have some degree of insulation between the president and the FTC, and that, that is not what the FTC does today. That bears no resemblance to what the FTC does today. And I think there's a very good chance that the, uh, uh, that, uh, the Supreme Court will wind up overruling uh, F, uh, the, the Humphreys executor uh, holding, and, and I would applaud that. I, th I think the, the, the whole idea of an independent agency these days makes just no sense at all. And what, what the agencies do today uh, uh, is, is not quasi-judicial and quasi-legislative. It is pure executive uh, functions. And, and so it's about time that the Supreme Court, are, and, uh, and, and I don't know how many of you were at lunch, but uh, uh, the question was asked of our two former uh, FTC commissioners at lunch, well, would that make any difference? And, and they said, well, probably not. Uh, I, I think that's totally wrong if you think not just about today's circumstances at the FTC, but you think more broadly. Here's an example. Uh, we are 30 months into the Biden administration and, and Joe Biden has no control over uh, telecommunications policy, none, because that agency has been 2-2 the entire time that he's been, he may never get control. And I don't happen to like his policies in telecommunication, but I think a president should have control over it, not some people who were appointed long ago by his, his, his predecessor. Uh, and, and think about it another way. Uh, suppose that a Republican is, is the next, uh, uh, elected as the next president. Do you suppose that if the pro that Republican president had the power to remove the FTC chair at, at, uh, at will, that Lena Khan would remain the chair of the Federal Trade Commission for more than two minutes after the inauguration ceremony? I mean, uh, it, it's incredibly important uh, uh, to, to overrule that precedent. I think there's a good chance they'll overrule it, and Illuminati provides a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, set of facts to, to, to justify that action. Well, I want to keep moving because we're starting to run short on time. So let me just turn to CFPB. Um, Professor Sateri, this is a particularly interesting case, I think, because the decision concludes that congressional action rather than executive action or judicial action can violate the Appropriations Clause. Do you think um, this matters in this particular case that we're talking about, Congress? And will the court perhaps be more deferential because we're talking about Congress delegating its own authority, perhaps, um, and be more inclined to respect the Article I branch's decision? Yeah, I, th I think that's a very interesting <clears throat> uh, distinction with, with the idea like normally we're reviewing perhaps executive branch practice with an agency, and, and should the court be more deferential to Congress and the executive branch? My Inclination is no. Uh, I think the judiciary is a co-equal branch with the executive and with Congress. Um, you shouldn't just overrule congressional decisions, uh, you know, just for kicks. Uh, but if Congress is exercising, operating outside of its legal authority, then it is the role of the judiciary uh, to say as much. And uh, I think often, particularly with Congress, the structural uh, problems that we see of Congress are often Congress kind of giving authority to someone else. So in the non-delegation context, they tell the agencies to go be good and nice, and then they, Congress can take all the, the credit and none of the blame when uh, the agency doesn't go be good and nice. Uh, and uh, I, I think similarly so here, Congress perhaps wants to duck uh, having to fund controversial uh, um, uh, policies, uh, and if, if this type of uh, funding uh, procedure gets approved by the Supreme Court going forward, uh, I think you're going to have a lot of agency heads uh, lining up on Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill asking for this very same uh, appropriations process, and I think Congress would be happy uh, uh, to duck a lot of those uh, tough uh, funding questions. Do you think um, if plaintiffs win, will this ruling 
necessarily have implications for other agencies or will perhaps be cabin to the facts of this particular agency in this particular ruling yeah. because it is a slightly unique. Yeah, well, if they adopt my approach, uh, <laughs> they can restrict it, uh, at least to an exercise of the Commerce Clause Authority in this instance. So wouldn't touch the post office, wouldn't touch the mint, um, wouldn't touch something like um, patent uh, boards. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I think the court would be smart to, to, be, to be specific about the type of um, agency it's talking about, but because the CFPB is, is pretty unique and, and intentionally so, um, I'm not sure it would have wide ripple effects across the agency. However, if the CFPB wins, I think we will have wide, wide ripple effects because as I mentioned, I think other agencies are going to say we want that as well. Let me turn to you, Greg. It, let's say the Supreme Court does uphold the funding structure as per, Professor Squitary led with. What do you think would be the consequence for Congress's role in our regulatory system? And sort of coupled on that, how important is the appropriations power um, in terms of accountability for federal agencies, in terms of oversight? Does it, does it matter? Well, I, I think it unquestionably matters. And, and I think, you know, the Supreme Court probably would view this as, as you know, critical to the, the separation of powers between the branches. And I think it's an interesting question to, to think about whether this case would look different if you just looked at it as the court reviewing a statute versus sort of the typical agency run amok. Although here, I think that the two are really combined in the sense that you've got this CFPB, which has this extraordinary power. And the question is whether this one aspect of its power you know, really is constitutional. And I think, you know, it's likely to play out a little bit like cellular law case and other cases where the court has looked at the CFPB and looked at, you know, really is there any kind of historical analog for what we're seeing here, the way in which they've, they've set up the funding that you can go directly to the Fed for the funding. Um, you know, Professor Pierce had mentioned the, the mining example earlier, and the, the government no doubt will come up with other examples that it might say that Congress has done similar things, but to the extent that the court views this really as a, as a first time type of thing, I think the court is not going to be particularly um, happy about it. And then the question will be, you know, how does the court craft its opinion? How does it, it draw the lines? But I think it would be concerned if it felt that, um, you know, even at the hands of Congress, it was setting up this agency that had this um, appropriations power um, that, that other agencies didn't. And I think that Professor Squidary is right that if, if Congress can do this for the CFPB, you can, you can bet that agencies will be lining up to get um, you know, similar power down the line. Professor Squidary, you touched upon this in your, in your opening, but I'll ask you the same question. Um, what does an agency's funding structure affect Congress's overpower, oversight power in a meaningful way? Uh, yeah, I think it does, because um, to keep the lights on, you need to make sure that Congress uh, uh, likes what you're doing, or at least you're not doing something that's bringing uh, too much unwanted attention, uh, congressional attention on yourself. Uh, you have the head of agencies routinely going forward to the committees, uh, updating Congress about what they're doing. Um, and if Congress went on unhappy, uh, not only will they let you know with letters and, and, and op-eds and all that, uh, but they uh, could threaten to withhold uh, your funding. So yeah, I think it's, um, if you don't, if you are not subject uh, to congressional funding, then um, I think that would, would make a, a big difference in the policies you proceed, which is why, if I might just add, um, I think the remedy in the CFPB case that the Fifth Circuit uh, adopted is correct. Uh, if you, the agency we don't know might have acted differently if it had, was subject to the constitutional limitations on funding. If it, you know, might think, is Congress going to be happy if I do this or not? Um, so I think the remedy it, uh, was correct that you're unconstitutionally funded, so you can't spend any of those unconstitutional dollars on really anything. I, it, we're running a little short on time, so I, I want to make sure I hit the student loan cases um, pretty quickly. Professor Pierce. These cases, um, before we get into sort of the major questions doctrine, they really implicate standing. Um, there are some significant standing issues in the case. And can you just go over the standing issue a, a bit? And you know, we're talking about um, the government 
perhaps giving money out. It, it's hard to find harm sometimes when that's when that's happening. Yeah. And because of this, do you think in these sort of cases, um, standing is uh, perhaps going to be a more contentious issue going forward? Okay, this is in the, in the context of the student loan. Okay, okay. In the uh, context of reviewing agency actions um, where there's a similar sort of uh, forgiving of debt or giving money out. Well, that would almost always be, and maybe always, to be a presidential action if it happens at all. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, that, that, that's certainly what this was all about. Uh, the, the president uh, saying, well, this is a national emergency. Uh, now it's ended, hasn't it? Uh, uh, but, but this is a national emergency, and therefore I'm, I'm modifying the terms of these contracts by canceling them. I, 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 I think the government's argument on the merits is hopeless. I, I think it's extraordinarily weak. They will lose for sure if they get to the merits. The, what I think they were betting on was that the court wouldn't reach the merits because the standing issue is very problematic. Uh, it's, it's very hard to see how uh, any of the parties that are attempting to challenge this have standing under the normal precedence of, of the court. I, I think they, they clearly do not. However, on standing, I am in the cynics camp. Uh, I, I think when a majority of the Supreme Court wants to decide a case, they find standing. When they don't want to decide a case, they find no standing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very clear that a majority of the court wants to decide this case. So I think they'll find standing. Uh, and, and, and it'll, it'll, but I will say that more broadly, I, I, this, this is a problem, a broader problem. Uh, suppose that uh, the, the, the next president is a Democrat and says, uh, I, I hereby uh, uh, authorize the spending of uh, a trillion dollars to, to fight climate change. Uh, who has standing to challenge that? Uh, under the precedents? No one. Suppose the next president is a Republican and he says, I hereby instruct IRS not to, to collect any uh, taxes on capital gains because I think they're immoral. Uh, uh, again, no one under their standing, I, I think they're going to have to revisit standing law in order to, to uh, allow them a point of entry into that class of cases because those, I think, would be totally outrageous. Uh, presidential actions. Greg, do you agree with that that point of view? That those are outrageous presidential actions. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> that no, standing I, I, might I, have to be I, revisited. I definitely agree that the, ch the standing issue is the more challenging aspect of that case. And based on the oral argument, it, it appeared that there would be a majority in at least one of the cases that would find standing, but it was unclear. And it, so it come down, you know, that well could be a 5-4 ruling on standing, and then I think it'd be more lopsided on the merits if, if they get to that. Professor Squitieri, I want to, especially since you are an expert on major questions doctrine, or at least have written extensively about it, the student loan cases implicate the major questions doctrine here. And, um, but it is in the context in these cases of an emergency authority. Um, that is what the government is, is arguing. How should we think about the major questions doctrine in the context of authorities granted to Congress for agencies to respond to emergencies? Yeah, so as far as the major questions doctrine is concerned, I'm not sure that the emergency status really matters. Um, at least two of the uh, major questions cases, uh, uh, the, the CDC uh, moratorium case and the OSHA uh, ETS case, both of those were emergency um, situations, and particularly the OSHA case, the, the standard was called an emergency temporary standard, uh, and still OSHA uh, lost under the major <laughs> questions doctrine. Uh, so uh, I definitely get the, um, the intuition that perhaps there might be moments when uh, um, we might be more forgiving of a president in an emergency uh, situation, but as far as doctrinally, uh, with the major questions doctrine, as it's been um, announced in the last two years or so. Uh, I don't think that the emergency uh, situation really cuts in the agency's favor or really cuts in any favor. What do you think, if, if Congress was considering future legislation um, to take action in an emergency, what do you think that Congress should consider 
in light of the major questions doctrine and how granular does Congress need to get in detailing the action that the agency can take in responding to an emergency? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question because on one hand, you might think the answer is, well, Congress should, should just be very specific about what it wants, uh, what it wants the agency to do, the power it's granting, uh, the agency clear congressional authorization as, as the, the court uses in the major questions cases. But the whole idea is that Congress really can't know uh, what some future facts uh, might present. So. I'm not really sure Congress can adjust its, uh, the way it drafts legislation much to respond to the major questions auction. They certainly can to respond to non-delegation questions by just not being too vague. But as a major questions auction, I think part of what the court is signaling is that even in an emergency situation, like with COVID, we want to funnel decision-making authority back to the Article I, Section 7 lawmaking process, back to Congress, and have Congress quickly uh, give power uh, uh, to an agency. So I'm not really sure an agency could um, pre predict with enough specificity uh, the, the necessary language because they don't know what, what's around the corner. Yeah. And uh, let me throw one last question to you, Greg, about sort of if the Supreme Court upholds on the merits of the president's actions in this case, or the administration's actions, I should say, in this case, what would be the limit to? the authority, presidential authority here. How broadly do you think a president can interpret a statute um, to assume new authorities? I know we have West Virginia v EPA. Yeah. Is that the limit or um, is there yeah. no limit? Yeah, I think it would take a major dent out of the question, the major questions doctrine uh, <laughs> as it exists today. Um, it'd be sort of hard to reconcile it. And, and yeah, I mean, I think it sort of goes back to the appropriations, the funding power that if the president can do that, then, we, then I think there is a significant shift, at least in terms of how we've, we've understood the, the funding power and the need for the executive to go to Congress to get that authorized through the appropriations process. Well, let me um, see if we have any questions from the audience. I want to make sure people get their questions asked. Yes, sir. Uh, Devin Watkins. Um, my question is to Gregory. It concerns the Axion case. In deciding the court's jurisdiction uh, to be able to hear these cases, perhaps do you think the court also decided the uh, question for preliminary injunction as to whether there was uh, irreparable harm? Because in deciding there is a here and now injury that can't be uh, fixed by a court of appeals, it seems like for injunctions, the only thing left is if they would actually prevail, or likely to prevail for a preliminary injunction. Is that your opinion of how you would read Axion? I think that's a good point. I mean, I think that'd be a fair argument based on the decision. I mean, it wasn't really teed up in that way specifically as you know, meeting the injunction factors, and you know, the government probably would argue that, but, but I, th I think um, it lends support to that argument that the court's recognition of that here and now injury would, would be a type of a rough harm. Yes, sir. Mark Chenoweth, with New Civil Liberties Alliance. Uh, Greg, thank you for, for mentioning NCLA's role in Cochrane. We've actually been involved in all four of the categories uh, that, that this panel uh, covers, uh, uh, three of them with original litigation and one as, as amicus. So if you want to litigate, we are hiring. Uh, uh, if, you're, you know, if this is the kind of thing that you want to do, uh, drop us a resume. Uh, but my question for, for you, Greg, is uh, what about stays on administrative proceedings? Are they going to be mandatory now, given that this has been deemed a here and now injury for proceedings to go forward in front of allegedly unconstitutional uh, ALJs? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And Mark was an integral member of the Cochrane team. Um, th that may be the next battleground. So all these cases go back, and we'll, we'll see um, you know, new, new Article Three actions in the district courts challenging the SEC and FTC proceedings. And then the question will be, can the agency proceedings go forward, or do you have to adjudicate the district court action first? And uh, I, I certainly think this, the better argument is that you should adjudicate the structural constitutional claims first, You know, getting back to the, the here and now injury point that we, we just mentioned. But I, I think there will be litigation on that, and I suspect district courts might go um, different ways. And you know, maybe that issue will, will get up to the court at some point. Thank you. Yes. I'm Jerry Cox. I have a question for Professor Pierce. You predict that Jarkazi would result in 
this enormous increase in jury trials. Are you not assuming that the agencies would bring in district court all the cases they currently put in front of their own ALJs? And the reason I ask that question is because I have handled dozens and dozens of agency administrative enforcement actions, and I will tell you every single one of them was utter garbage. They would never, ever put that in front of a U.S. District Judge to save their lives. They will only put it in front of ALJs, who they know will rule 100% in their favor. So how do you get to the conclusion that you're going to have a huge increase from Dracasey because of uh, When I was comments? in practice, I handled a few hundred of those cases. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, On the garbage side or the non-garbage <laughs> side? Uh, I, 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 I often differed with the agency. I never had occasion to characterize their position as garbage. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, most of those cases are rate-making cases. That's the, the, the just and reasonable standard that, that was applied in jury trials uh, as, as long ago as, as the 15th century uh, and was applied in, certainly in 1789 uh, was applied to innkeepers uh, in jury trials. Today, all of that is done by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in determining rates, uh, and by the Federal Communications Commission in determining rates, and the Surface Transportation Board in determining rates. And, and those cases, I, I, I don't know what you mean by garbage, because every one of those cases is, is the uh, customers against the supplier. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> well, I'd be happy to give anybody a list of garbage cases that I guarantee you will never go. Cases like those coming out of the Transportation Department, the Energy Department, and so forth, they would never go to a U.S. District Judge with a straight face. It just wouldn't happen. Well, I don't know where else you're going to get rate making accomplished if agencies are not allowed to do it because uh, the, 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 the regulated firm is entitled to a jury trial in every case. As cu customers, and you're all customers of regulated utilities, you would have nothing if they don't go to court and, and win a hell of a lot of jury verdicts. And I don't know where they would, we would come up with the resources to handle I'm all those jury about trials. I'm talking about enforcement cases. I'm going to sit down now, but I'm talking about enforcement cases where agencies are trying to take away property of regulated entities by making allegations that The regulated entities make that argument in every rate case, every single rate case. That is one of their arguments, that the government is taking their property. All I can say is I hope that we get a favorable decision in Tarkasi and you find out that you're wrong about the number that we have <laughs> I think you we have time. Some money on that, I'm glad to talk with you <laughs> afterwards. Otherwise, I'm through. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a, a David Tryon with the Buckeye Institute in Ohio. Just a similar question in jury trials. My experience with jury trials is you never get there. 99% of all civil cases, uh, and most criminal cases, but I don't know anything about those because I don't do that, but almost all are settled. They're either done, handled through a magistrate that, that mediates them and gets them settled, or otherwise they're settled. So do you really believe that you would actually get to a jury trial and all the, those things, or would they have a similar settlement well, rate? That's a good point. The, 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 the most cases that are theoretically subject to a jury trial, uh, well, we know the figures on that. We've got solid figures on that. Uh, uh, slightly over 99% never go to the jury, uh, where the jury trial, uh, uh, but that then raises the question of what the hell is good as a right that nobody can exercise as a practical matter, and nobody does exercise except in, in less than 1% of all cases. Uh, uh, I, I have a big problem with the Seventh Amendment generally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to end on that note, <laughs> but, but I, I think that we are, have hit our time. And as you can see, there's so much to talk about with these cases. We could talk for hours about it, um, but unfortunately we cannot today. I want to thank our wonderful panel for this discussion and our great audience for some really great questions. Thank you so much to all of you. Did you like to